Hello, and welcome to Power in Mind, the sports psychology podcast. I'm your host, Mike Seeley. My guest today is Bob Mianski, a two-time Olympic cyclist and former national champion, best known for his remarkable result at the 1988 Summer Olympic Games in Seoul, South Korea, where he placed fourth in the road race, achieving the same time as the third place finisher and an extremely close finish. His performance at the 88 Games was the best performance by an American athlete or American cyclist at a full participation Olympics, that is an Olympics without a boycott since 1912. Because of his outstanding achievement, Bob was named U.S. Amateur Cyclist of the Year. In 1992, he once again represented the U.S. at the Summer Olympics in Barcelona, Spain. Although he didn't repeat his incredible 1988 performance, he did help his then young teammate, Lance Armstrong, to a respectable top 15 finish. Finally, in 1993, after amassing over 100 career victories, Bob Mianski retired from cycling. He's now an attorney based in Portland, Oregon, with a practice in bicycle law. He's also the author of Bicycling and the Law, Your Rights as a Cyclist, and Legally Speaking, his regular column for Vela News Magazine. During his cycling career, Bob was known as a fierce competitor whose mental toughness made him extremely hard to beat. Here's just a few quotes from some of his former competitors and teammates. Olympian Roy Nickman said about Bob, he was a fighter on the bike, very strong, very powerful. He could fight on the climbs and sprint with the best. Very few people have done that in American cycling. Uh, former teammate John Lohner said of Bob, he used psychology as well as his legs to win races and riled up a lot of people doing that. It's definitely true. <laughs> Rob Egger of Specialized Bicycles said, Mentally, he is the toughest guy I've seen on a bike. And Lance Armstrong once said of Bob, he'll do anything to get your attention off the race. Please welcome two-time Olympian, national champion, attorney, bicycle law advocate, and master of psychology, Bob Mianski. Bob, welcome. Hi, Mike. Nice to be here. All right. Good to have you. Hey, so um, I wanted to get started today um, by sharing with folks kind of how I got to know you briefly and my sort of introduction to your psychological toughness. And this was, as you recall, uh, a cyclocross bicycle race back in, it was like winter in Wisconsin in these miserable conditions. And you gave me a ride to the race. And I had been training quite a bit, prep, maybe even too much. I was in really good shape. And it became apparent that, you know, I think we were the best guys there. We broke away, but I felt stronger. And um, I was pretty excited, like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm feeling stronger than Bob Mianski. This is awesome. I got all psyched up and confident. And what really impressed me about you, and I was kind of taken aback, was that you kind of got into my head. You were saying, like, hey, man, you can't sustain this effort this long. And you were saying, like, hey, you better slow down. And I was kind of like, what's maybe he's right. And, um, you ended up basically, I, I don't know about psyching me out, but like you were really, really tenacious and you stuck with it. And when I was feeling like I didn't even think that you could attack, like you attacked and blasted past me. And I was like, how did he do that? Because I was in better shape. And anyway, I wanted to share that story because, um, you know, uh, we're friends, we go way back and, Really what I was impressed with, Bob, was uh, your, your tenacity and your psychology when you were racing. You were, like those quotes I read about you are totally true. Um, would you agree with some of those quotes of just your tenacity and, and your mental toughness on a bike? Yeah, you know, uh, as the, inside your, inside your own head, it's a different, there's a different uh, process going on. Yeah how you appear on the outside is sometimes different than what you think. Um, I think probably they all have a common thread if I can remember what they, what, what the nexus was. And, and the idea is that if, um, if you're in a fight, whether it's boxers, wrestlers, and it's clear one of the opponents is kind of up against the ropes metaphorically. Yeah there's a natural conclusion that one expects and when they don't see it, it's notable. So for instance, if there was a steep climb on a race, um, I might suffer, you know, 
more than a lot of the other top competitors if it was a race I had a chance in. And so they think, well, this guy doesn't have it today. But in my mind, I'm thinking of, you know, what I'm going to have to be doing in four hours. Right. So I'm, so I'm, I'm minimizing my effort. And so I'm suffering, essentially. Yeah. They're seeing the outward effects of my suffering. Yeah. And typically, you know, the, the best guys do the least suffering, you know, and eventually they're the last guy standing and then they mix it up. And um, I would start suffering early sometimes. Uh -huh. And then essentially what would happen is, uh, and it would be tough, uh, but when it got down to a few guys and I recognized, oh, they're suffering too, welcome, welcome to my place. You right. know, I've been here for an hour, now you're there. Uh -huh. And it was interesting to watch how, you know, how long they could hang in that zone. Right. And, you know, so I, I, I guess those quotes all sort of touch on that issue. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, well, what I remember uh, is you were not a natural, say, like, you know, mountain climber in terms of you were, you were fine on, like, the, the, the shorter, steeper things. But in terms of, say, like, you know, riding in a, in a major tour, like, and say, if you were in the Alps in France, you would not be with, say, like, the best climbers. Would you agree? Oh, I, I would have a hard time being with the, the main body of the field. I would be lining up with the other, you know, people are familiar with the Tour de France uh, or a stage race. There's what they call the laughing group. Although, yeah. you know, nowadays it's, it's, it's a, it's a full gas kind of an effort, but essentially what happens is people have to minimize their losses. They know they can't stay with the front group instead of riding at full limit and blowing up. They yeah. back off and met out their effort and they even have teammates come back and help them. So, you know, you, you'd find yourself back in that group. And, and for me, it would really be uh, a matter of uh, survival when it's, you know, got longer than a mile, two miles. Right. A mile, right. three mile climb. When I was on good form on a classic race, you know, where you're putting everything out all day, I could do okay in a one to two, but uh -huh. three miles, it's more, uh, you know, it's an aerobic effort at that point. Right. I really wasn't um, a very good aerobic cyclist. Right. Right. So that's where beyond say the three miles or so is when just your, your natural sort of body weight and your frame and your structure and sort of your just genetic en endowments of, of being a climber really kick in as opposed to below say, you know, two, three miles where you can, you can power over it kind of no matter what your body type is. Exactly. That's okay. right. Okay. Yeah. Um, one question I wanted to ask you, Bob was, um, during your career, were you ever in any kind of uh, like, like a slump where you felt like either quitting the sport or you felt like, um, just, you know, kind of a downturn in your career? And if, if so, if there was that that happened, how did you get out of it, if you recall? Absolutely. Uh, and in fact, I'd say that's more of the norm than the exception when you watch uh, some of my teammates careers or just, you know, watching the trajectory of other cyclists. There's there can be a one, two, three year period where you you feel like you're doing everything right, but you're not getting the results. And right. that's a huge challenge um, as, as you're referencing. That's just uh -huh. psychologically devastating and, and I think what happens I mean if you're watching the tour now um, you know we're in the I think the end of the first week yeah and there's some riders that are up to their normal standards like Mark Cavendish and, and Marcel Kittle and they're both sprinters but they're having a hard time uh, having the strength to stay in position before they even sprint and yeah. so you keep backing down your expectations and then it's just like uh, can I get any result to buoy me. Um, if you're on a trade team and you're a leader, that's a big, that's a big problem. If you're on a team with a lot of other uh, athletes that are close to your ability, which was the back in 30 years ago, American cycling teams weren't designed as much around uh, sort of the football idea where you have a quarterback, a running back, lineman, everyone having a, a role. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of, m most everyone just came from the national team. So they were all proven race winners and we tried to put them together on a team. Yeah. So if you were in a slump, you could still contribute to the team. And yeah. you see Cavendish doing some work at the beginning of the race, even these days. Yeah. Because he's saying essentially like I'm all in, you know, motivationally, but I'm just, I don't have it right now. 
And so that, that had kind of an ameliorating effect on poor form. You just go out and you do, you do some good things for the team. And then, um, you know, without that pressure, sometimes you, you, you can find your legs again. But I, I understand your question. And what it really um, points to is what do you do when uh, it's not going well and you're not getting good feedback? Yeah. You know, you just keep on keeping on. I, I don't have a great answer for it. Um, I didn't, I didn't ever feel like quitting when I was in that scenario, but it, it if it went on year for year, um, the sport would take care of it itself because you lose your sponsorship. Sure. Sure. Lose your job. And so there's that added pressure as well. Um, you know, I know for an amateur athlete, recreational athletes, you, you're, it's self-imposed pressure or maybe peer pressure. Mm -hmm. When you're making a living at it, it's a whole nother burden. And, um, you know, you already have a contract. You got to keep the money coming in. Right. Yeah. They're, sure. they're, they're, that's a big piece of it. It's a job at that point. Yeah. 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 It also reminds me there was an, another quote from, I think it was this article in this Wisconsin paper where you said, I never let myself be satisfied after a victory. Do you remember that? No. Okay. No. But okay. yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's kind of true. Um, I don't know if that's accurate across the board, but the idea is the next race is right around the corner. And there's something strange about getting a result like that. We probably all had this experience and, and treated it differently. But for me, when something good happened, so for instance, when I made uh, the first Olympic team, it was kind of surreal, but something told me, don't, don't treat this like, um, like Christmas morning as a child. Yeah. Um, you know, there's an old metaphor is like, don't act like, you know, like I've been to the dance before, you know, because it went well, why not see how much further it can go, which means you shouldn't sit around celebrating and patting yourself on the back. I, you know, it, it, there's an analogy to learning when you learn something, you learn a little trick, whether it's doing a wheelie or a new ability to play music or whatever it is you've accomplished. If you stop and have a real prideful moment of reflection and really enjoy it, you don't necessarily get back into where you were in that mm -hmm. vein that you were mining, where you were moving along. You said, Hey, well, look at this. I'm actually doing this. And what, but that act of self-reflection yeah. kind of puts the parachute on it. Uh -huh. okay. So it's a battle between the ego saying, wow, look at this incredible thing. I want to, I want to have this ego food, baby food yeah. versus the discipline to say, don't do that. Stay focused on whatever it was you're doing. See right. how much better it can go. Like if you were walking along, you know, you would accomplish something by, uh, you know, walking along, balancing yourself. And when you broke your record, you could, you could rejoice or you could um, pass that urge and keep going and find out well, I could go a lot further. And so for me going into the sport, getting better results, I was focused that way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I see what you mean. Do you think it's possible to, to say celebrate rest on your laurels you know, a bit and still kind of like shift gears right back into that, that really the hunger mindset, or do you think there's like a real like trap there? Like you say, I think it probably depends on the person, um, personal psychology and, and all sorts of other variables. But uh, it's certainly, it's an exaggeration to say I, that, that you shouldn't celebrate. I, I'm always kind of surprised by how much people celebrate victories. Mm -hmm. You know, the way they celebrate, especially with their, their competitor, you know, an inch away on the line, the way they – and I understand it's a big sport now and they get a lot of attention, but yeah. it seems to me – you know, it seems to me that um, that you don't really want to do that um, because you're putting a target on your back. I mean, if you're at the top of the sport, all the rules are different. Sure. But if you're one of the guys trying to get up to another level, yeah, I just don't think you know. If if I come around uh, one of the world's top sprinters, I'm not going to overly celebrate. And and it, and it goes back to the theme that we're sort of talking about. You know, I don't, that isn't the last thing I want to do that right. I just did. You know, mm -hmm. I want to I kind of believe I'm going to be here. When a new rider comes up, there's a lot of resistance against him. He's lucky. Yeah. I beat him. He's not that good. Right. You know, I've been on both sides of that, mostly on the side where other guys are coming up. And I'm like, no, the guy isn't that good. 
you know, I, um, and then, and then one day it just clobbers you over the head and it becomes self-evident. Yeah. So that's a process right there that everyone handles differently. Mm -hmm. And you talked about, uh, you know, we had, we were talking earlier before we started this podcast about the thermostat effect. Yeah. And, um, it was, it was a concept I hadn't heard of. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm suggesting, uh, you might want to, for your listeners or viewers explain it, but I, I, I would go the opposite way. Uh huh. In this instance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you break it down. I'm not really. It's a new concept to me. Yeah. Yeah. So the thermostat effect, basically, the metaphor is like a thermostat. So um, think of, say, for example, um, you're com come up to the ranks, and you're you're beating some top sprinters. You're doing really really well. And say like last year. Well, this reminds me of this. In, in your career, you went from, uh, this is, as I recall, it went from a category four racer, just, you know, just starting out to, I think it was a cat category one by the very end of the season. And this really incredible rise through the ranks. And what I remember about that was sort of the audacity behind that and thinking about the thermostat effect. So say, for example, um, if you start out the season, say, as a Category 4, and then you make it up through the ranks, basically make it from a 4 to a 3, arguably not that hard, 3 to a 2, a little bit harder, but then from a 2 to a 1, like that's an auda audacious move. And so the thermostat effect would be, say, that you're like, you just make it um, from a 4 all the way to Cat 2, and you go, well, that was crazy. Like, that was, I can't believe I did that almost like I don't belong here. Like you're racing with the cat one, two pros and there's something in, in the back of your mind. that's like, well, that's a little too audacious. Like I really probably, I really maybe don't belong here. Kind of like the imposter syndrome where you're like, yeah, well, like hmm, maybe I'm not that good. Maybe I shouldn't make that bold move. Um, and so the thermostat effect is this sort of subconscious thing that goes on where you actually self-sabotage. It's, it's really kind of weird but it's the sort of fear of change where you're going like, um, say for example, you're uh, just make it into cat one, two pros and you just kind of start not racing well. And clearly you have, you know, the ability there's what that is, is subconsciously there's this thermostat going, you're not really this good. Like you should not be doing this. This is scary. This could lead to a career in cycling. This could put more pressure on you. So kind of like the, the air conditioning uh, kicks in and you actually maybe downgrade to a category three. This is the thermostat effect. And I, I brought it up before this podcast when we were chatting because it was that, that season that I remember watching you. I was a junior, you were, um, you were a senior racer. And I remember talking with uh, my, my junior buddies, you remember some of these guys, and we're like, who is this guy? Like, the audacity that he has to, like, move all the way through the ranks. Like, there's clearly, like, he's going to, you know, snap. He doesn't really belong here, but you did belong there. And I was really impressed with that. So that's why I brought up the thermostat effect and sort of this idea of imposter syndrome. And, and you're mentioning now, like, keep pushing yourself up. Like, where is the next level? Like, I'm not afraid. I'm really curious. Or like the sort of curiosity of what's the next level. Was that, would you say that that was your mindset? Is that kind of my being accurate in my observations? Well, you know, this, this, this probably happens in a lot of aspects of life, of course. And yeah. I guess I, I went to a lot of different grade schools and what I recognized was patterns. Uh-huh from one school to the next. Oh, there's the popular kid. There's the bully. There's the sycophant. Okay. You know, there's the backstabber. And then there it is again. And there it is again. And it occurred to me, you decide what you're going to be and you be it. And, yeah. and there was an inkling of this feeling of being an imposter because, you know, you think water finds its own level. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm an imposter doing this but you forget after a while. Mm -hmm. And so I had this background from a very young age of recognizing, I guess, intuitively that if you can do it, then you're there. And so for me, and in sport, there's so much suffering in our sport that if I beat you, 
I was a fighter, okay, let's be honest. I was a physical fighter. I got in a lot of fights, and I approached bicycle racing like a fight. Uh-huh. And I didn't, certainly wasn't going to give up in yeah. the middle of a fight when I thought I was stronger than the other guy, or I still had a chance to win. There's just no chance I would give up. So, the, you know, the thermostat effect doesn't resonate with me at all within the realm of sport. Sure. Well, what's interesting is um, what I remember in, in, in watching you uh, back in the day, and other writers told me this too, was that you definitely were a fighter. And I found that inspirational in terms of uh, this idea of, say, like the ripple effect in sports where you don't necessarily know how other people are viewing you or uh, judging you or being inspired by you. Um, and I think that there's, there's certain certain riders who really inspired a lot of other riders. And I would say that you were one of them by your result, especially in the 88 Olympics of this, again, this sort of this audacious, like got an American doing that well, like that's, that's amazing. And it sort of, it breaks this sort of, this sort of glass ceiling of, wow, like, you know, that's, that's possible. Um, I can be the smartest person in the room or I can be that adult in the room. There's, there's room, like there's always more room at the top kind of thing. So I just wanted to mention that. I, I think that you were definitely an inspiration for a lot of riders. Hmm. Well, that's nice to hear. Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. Um, another question I had, Bob, was um, in terms of sort of like nature and nurture, certainly like your, your psychology growing up um, helped form kind of like your, you know, your, your attitude during races. And then you also mentioned, say someone has everything handed to them, like they have like, say the, I'm talking about athletics, the best trainers, uh, maybe their whole family's into cycling, and they, they have a lot of you know, genetic natural talent. Um, how important, in terms of like ratio, nature, nurture, would you say would be important for, for a champion? Is um, you know, the context of your support uh, spectrum really, really important, or is it more so just purely like the psychological internal drive? What would you say? Yeah, it's... it's um... Yeah, sure. Those are two good rubrics, but they both can be broken down. And I've also come to the conclusion, and I'll, and I'll answer your question the best I can. I've come to the conclusion that those are both malleable as well. So for instance, you're like, no, you're born with what you're born with. That's your nature. And, but do you know what your nature is? Do you really know? Yeah. Um, and, and so I made a, there's a lot of room there that people don't recognize but then on the nurture um and 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 there's no fine there's no hard line between the two so you say well he was born mentally tough yeah okay but um everyone's suffering at some point right and um can you teach yourself to suffer more uh-huh. you know so so this is so you can change your level of mental strength you know you're, you're given your tool set and then you can change it so to answer your question nature and nurture on the outside, the you know the overview answer is that cycling is all about psychology. It yeah. really is, and self pushing yourself. I mean, we all honestly. I, I I remember a couple riders that I didn't understand why they were on the circuit, why they were wasting their time. Mm-hmm. And like six years later, they started to actually get results. Uh-huh. So, it, you know, they need to incubate a little bit longer, maybe like a huge amount of longer. I mean, that was an exception, but yeah. Um, nature is going to be great, but at the end of the day in our sport, it comes down to a fight at the very end. You know, that's why there were riders that I raced with on the national team. There was most of the guys on the national, from the Midwest, we raced to win. We would just attack, attack all the time. There was massive style. Yeah. But there's another kind of rider that has a lot of ability that thinks, okay, I don't want to waste it. I, at the end, when it gets really hard, I'll rise to the top. And if there's a time trial or a long climb or some kind of you know, challenge that allows him or her to do that, that's yeah. great. But if there isn't, it's going to go to this whole other uh, realm, you know, of it's basically egos. It's, mm-hmm. the, you know, my sense of self and your sense of self and, you know, it, it that does seem like nature, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I see it in my daughter, I see it in my Jack Russell, yeah. you know, and <laughs> just indomitable. It's, yeah. it's, so that does seem like something that we're born with uh-huh. for better or for worse, trust me. And um, the three of us, my daughter, my dog and me, uh-huh. um, you know, 
there's just something, you know, and, 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 and that really, that really informed my cycling, uh-huh. you know? So I don't have a really solid answer, but what's really interesting to me is below those two rubrics of nature and nurture is what could you do? So you have your natural body, but it's, it's not fixed. It's, it's plastic. Yeah. And I have strongly believe you can convert your body. Okay. So for instance, I had a really poor VO2. I, I couldn't run. I played football. I abhorred running around the track nine times. I couldn't do it. Yeah. Like I just couldn't mentally do it. I'd rather do push-ups. I was like a push-up champion. You know, I, I like the anaerobic pain. Uh-huh. I could see other guys couldn't do it and I would just keep going and it motivated me. Yeah. But when we ran instantly, I was on my back foot watching everyone run away. So yeah. naturally I wasn't going to do any running, any breathing sports. Right. So the way I was introduced to aerobics was using muscle to get myself up and at speed with the very fastest guys. And then I had to figure out how to stay with them. Uh-huh. And so I fell back down into aerobics, shot myself out there with this kind of mix. And then I had to drop back down and try to hold it. And that's how I learned to actually develop my lung power, my VO2, my hematocrit. And I got to the point, at the, if you race with guys enough and that are fast enough, which is another point we should you know, talk about, the yeah. importance of being around individuals that are stronger than you. It's not just mental. I believe it's metaphysical. If you're around another stronger rider and you're on their wheel and you're suffering with them, you're like one organism with two heads. And I've lived through that. And I mean, yeah. we experienced that in the cyclocross race. Uh-huh. I experienced that with Armstrong when we were just the two of us off the front. Mm-hmm. It was like I could pull his energy and he could pull mine. Yeah. And, and so it, never underestimate the, the, the value of uh, being in a sport around people that are better than you. Yeah. you'll learn all those obvious rational things. But then if you're willing to go there, there's, there's something behind the curtain that's happening too. Yeah. Yeah. Which is very important. Um, so I believe that your, your, your nature, your, your mental state and your physical sort of toolbox can actually be changed through breath work, through, you know, smart training. Right. Um, and then, yeah. and, and cycling is a, especially great for this because there's gears on the bike. Yeah. True. You don't, oh, you can roll a bigger gear mm-hmm. or, you know, and then the terrain varies. Okay. So maybe your day is going to be when we have the uphill time trial in a couple of weeks, you'll just smoke everybody. Cause that's what you're good at. Yeah. It's not a lot of sports where there's that much of a, um, you know, a, a, a range of abilities that can come to the top and win. We watching the tour de France, they look all normal size. When you go up and see one of these riders up close, Yep. Even Tom Boonen was like a big monster out there. When you see him in person, he's, when he was still racing, he's right. a guy. Yeah. Six foot three, 170 pounds, 180 pounds. He's yeah. probably 200 pounds now. And when you see him, their arms are skinny. They're just yeah. emaciated. Yeah, the arms especially, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just changes your body riding a bike. So yeah. anyhow, it's yeah. interesting stuff to watch what people can do with what they're given. Yeah. One of the things you can do, and I know this is your world, Mike, um, is ask somebody what goes through your mind when you're going as hard as you can. Yeah. And that's very illuminating and it's a great starting point. And it doesn't, there isn't a secret answer, but what you do is you open the conversation with yourself. Yeah. Because if it's, if it's, if it's an area that needs reflection, it might open opportunities. Um, yeah. Yeah. And this dovetails with another concept, if I might. Sure. Um, I believe that when you're going as hard as you can, you have to sit and get comfortable with the effort. Yeah. And it's only then that you're able, um, think of it this way. Think about your, your, your chi or your power, your actual, uh, the amount of life force coming through you as like some kind of a circular gauge. And it's like this and, and, and you take off. And as you use it, let's say the race starts and there's a steep hill, it comes down, you're choking it right down. You're, you, you're at your limit. You're at your limit at some point you're going to snap. Mm -hmm. If you have the opportunity, either psychologically or during the race or drafting to get comfortable as it gets here at that workload, you start to open up and allow the rest of yourself to come through again. And that's a very difficult process. And it has a lot to do with the same thing. Uh, It's, it's related to the idea of what, where does your mind go when you're going as hard as you can? Are you thinking I'm afraid now? Yeah. It's our natural instinct to stay alive as humans. For sure. Yeah. And all this feedback that, you know, I don't feel like I'm getting enough air. I'm yep. in pain everywhere. Yeah. 
And then in cycling, there's people crashing, there's <laughs> people cutting me off, there's sand in the road, there's a hill coming up, I'm overheating. It's a devastatingly difficult sport, especially the way we came up in the Midwest where, you know, everyone's attacking all the time and you don't know if the winning break's going to go in the first mile right. or it's going to be a field sprint. Um, but this idea of getting comfortable you know where you are it you literally feel your shoulders drop when it happens and this is what a lot of the breath work teaches you mm -hmm. yeah. you hold your breath and you start you know you just ask somebody off the street if they're willing to play a game with you hold your breath you watch them they tighten 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 right you know and and then, then they gasp for air and if you have them do another one they'll go a lot longer the second time right. but if you give them some coaching mm -hmm. if you say next time when you feel i absolutely have to gasp for air just surrender just for a split second mm -hmm. and watch their shoulders will drop yeah capillaries open up they are opening themselves back up they're accepting where they are free divers learn to do this and they end up staying down for you know incredibly long periods of time underwater and so i think that's that's that that ties the physiology with the psychology because the physiology comes to you as information through your psychology you know it gets filtered through your mind yeah. right so, this is what makes it makes cycling so fascinating and all sports are like this, but cycling just throws it all into the recipe right there. And then yeah. the ego, the teammates, the inner competition, all of that, the, the, the conditions, your form, your, your fears. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you notice that everybody's like, a, you know, like a surviving group. And we'd have these road races back in the Midwest. It'd be very hot and humid. 100 miles and at the it was like you didn't even remember you were still in, it was the same day you know <laughs> you know here we are and you don't care it's like you're a survivor like our, our as a species our ancestors went through this yeah yeah you know, like, there was no more food in the valley you had to get up and get to the next valley and not everybody was going to make it right yeah you know, so we have it in us we have this atavistic For i'm sure. going to survive you know yeah and so it's tapping into that without yeah. giving away to giving way to fear yeah. Yeah. I think that's really the key. There's like, you know, getting curious and comfortable um, with that, that zone to say. So like when you feel, say you're going up a, like a hill in a, in a bike race and you feel like, Oh my God, I'm going to snap or I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm not getting enough air is uh, sort of pausing and being curious and getting into that zone and going, okay, like accepting like, all right, well, here's, here's the pain. Here's the suffering. This, this is interesting. And, and sitting with that, not panicking and not saying, I want to, the suffering to end, but kind of getting more, more into it and more comfortable. That is, I think, really key, uh, especially in, in sports like cycling or uh, running or, you know, aerobic sports is getting into that, into that sort of, yeah, like you say, when the circle closes, you know, when, when you're there getting really comfortable with, uh, with that zone. That's fascinating. Yeah, you know, that, that process, I, I think, I mean, uh, you remember the race in Ripon? I do remember, yes. Ripon, race. Wisconsin, an incredibly steep hill. Remember that, yeah. Yeah, you know, and it's burning hot. And, you know, if the wind is behind you, you're getting no cooling, right? Yeah. So you're moving with the air. Right. And it, it's, it almost feels, I mean, the first times I did it, it felt like I was, I was dying. Like, I, it, to me, and this is, this is something maybe for another call, or we can get into it a little bit, but it, it reminded me of holding my breath underwater. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know? And you, you have this like, I, Hey, this is dangerous. Yeah. I want to go a little bit further because I want to come up further down the lake than my friend. <laughs> so you're, yeah. you, you're already playing with these, these opposing motivations of surviving and winning. Right. You right. start playing with that line. And so what I noticed for me, especially it took me a long time to get going yeah. in a race is that everyone would hit the climb and they would just be basically sprinting up this wall. Yep. And, and I would think this, I don't want to do this. I can't, this is, it's too early in the race. And there was something that would just click this complaining, this voice yeah. needs to get out of here. Yeah. Which is that sitting down on it and just accepting it. Right. You know, you know, like one of the best advice in life is just accept what happens. You know, you, you, you can't change a lot of things. You can't change getting older. You can't change the weather. Right. You can't change other people's actions. Yeah. You have to accept it. Or you can refuse to accept it and just suffer. Right. right. And so, and that voice will talk about why they're unhappy in this particular 
scenario. Right. But if you accept it, so if you accept the pain, uh -huh. there's this kind of relaxation and, and then really there's, there's voices that shut down. And when you get down to the last voice, which is just about being completely present, yeah. that's how you ride. Yeah. That's why we ride up hills. People don't know it, but you're doing, instead of taking a drug or alcohol and getting the good feeling, um, and then the hangover, you're doing the hangover first. Yeah. You're yeah. inducing pain in your body, yeah. discomfort, you accept the pain, and all of a sudden, everything seems easier and clearer. You get to the top of the hill, your head is clear, you know, and, and, and it really extrapolates to the rest of your life and why we get exercise addicts, you know, yeah. and, and it, because they start to rely on physical pain is probably behind what's behind cutters, you know, uh -huh. people that cut themselves. Sure, sure. You know, that's kind of a, uh, a drastic um, jump, but it's, it's the same concept. Pain has a, has a, a strong effect on our psychology. Sure. And you have to develop, you know, people now talk about the pain cave, which is a really, you know, mm -hmm. apt way to describe what we're talking about. Yeah. Definitely. I don't think it existed when that, that phrase didn't exist when we were racing, but it sure fits. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's fascinating, Bob, when you talk about sort of like the acceptance and like the voices start to, to disappear when you start accepting, say you're in a race and it's really, really painful and you could complain, you could c come up with these uh, like self-talk in your head, like this sucks. I hate this. Um, how long is this going to last? I can't wait for this race to be over with. Um, but then if you can accept like, hey, here I am, it actually, it can become so rewarding and so rich to dive into that. And then afterwards, like how proud, how great you feel about yourself of making it through that, you know? And, it isn't, and it's, it's kind of like it's not suffering. It's more of an opportunity. Like all it is is physical pain. Like you're not going to die from it, right? Like unless you have like a heart condition or something. Mm -hmm. But you're really, you're not going to die from the pain of a race. And what a great opportunity to silence some of those voices, which is like, that's your familiar. That's what a lot of people do is like, oh, this is too painful. I don't want to do this. But again, you accept it, you get into it and you go, oh, this is how fascinating is this? I'm going faster than I've ever gone. I'm staying with people I've never stayed with before. And then afterwards, like it, it, it is such a great feeling. I totally know what you're talking about. Of, you know, those those sort of critical complaining voices start to drift away once you get curious and comfortable with that, that pain zone. Fascinating stuff. And so we could call that brain control. For sure. Yeah. And that's, and that's, and then how, and you, and you naturally, if you have the right personality, you ask, well, how far can I take this? Yeah. Right. Right. And, and you know, essentially that's what martial arts are. Yeah. That's what, you know, that's what a lot of uh, sports are. Zuki had something to say, apparently. <laughs> Fairly chiming in. Yeah. He probably hears your voice. Um, <laughs> but, you know, yeah, you got to test yourself under fire and it's better to do it on your own. Uh, one of my favorite things to do when I had a big event coming, I mean, I did this at varying levels. Like one of the levels was from an annual sense. You know, like I know I'm going to do this really, really hard effort in July, but I'm not going to do it yet. Yeah, I would inch my way up to it, and right. when I get there, when I give up in a race or in a training, I'd say, "Could you could you go another five seconds, and then I won't ask you to do any more." I essentially negotiated with my body, yeah. and I lied to it a lot. I said, <laughs> "I'll never ask you to do this again." <laughs> right, just but, this once, yeah. But what you're doing is you're prepping yourself, you're role playing for the for the day that you you know that you're the race that means something to you. Right, for sure. I think that's hugely important. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I want to want to wrap things up here, Bob. Um, just quickly, if you could give, um, I would say, one piece of advice to a young up and coming professional cyclist um, who wants to make it in the sport, what would it be? I know it's not necessarily one thing, but a piece yeah, well, of advice for a young up and coming. So your, 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 your example has to do with somebody, it sounds like they've already made it. They're a young professional. Yeah. Let, let's say that, you know, they've reached a certain level where they're, you know, starting to make a living at cycling and they, you know, they're young enough where they want to make the commitment and really get into it. What's a, some advice you would have to give them success, longevity, satisfaction in the career of a professional bike racer? Well, you, you, you do need to, you need to always take kind of the overview. You can't celebrate your victories too much 
and you can't you can't get up you can't get high on yourself when you win and we were talking about that earlier yeah. and the reason is because you can't get hard, back down on yourself when you're not doing well uh -huh. Even, both of those are false things to do to yourself so that's one is to have this overview you know of, of, of where you're trying to go but I mean in a practical sense it's a different answer you know find your niche you know right. Nowadays, yeah. you got to you gotta come up. I mean, I had Phil Gaiman come to me um, many years ago and ask for advice and ask if I would represent him some work I had done with professionals. And he asked me what he could do. You know, how is he going to get on the next level up? And I said, you got to win races <laughs> when the good guys are in town. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't necessarily what he wanted to hear, but he went and he did it. And I'm not taking any credit for it. He was on that trajectory. Right. But essentially, you got to stand out depending on what level you want to get to. You got it. So if you're a sprinter or a sprinter climber or a time trialist or you're a worker or you're like this killer guy that can give a great lead out mm -hmm. or you're, you know, find your niche and then develop it, right. you know, and, and then make yourself prominent in that role. Yeah. And, and you know, um, you, we can talk about this next time, but there's this peer group thing that happens when you're leaving one group and they're all, they don't want you to uh -huh. They'll whisper in your ear, you know, metaphorically speaking that, you know, you don't belong and you're not going to that level. I, I got a lot of that coming up, Yeah, yeah. you know, and those same people, once you make it, they, they pat you on the back, like they were your supporters. So you got to be ready for that. Yeah. Nobody yeah. wants to be left behind. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. All right. Well, Bob, uh, we're running out of time here, but really fascinating conversation with you today. It's, it's a, always a pleasure to talk. We haven't talked for a while, so it's great to catch up with you. Um, I wanted to ask you, where can people find out more about you, what you do as a bicycle law attorney and advocacy for cycling? Um, where can they find you, say, on the internet and, and things like that? Yeah, it's quite easy. I'm a part of an organization called bikelaw.com and we're advocates. Everyone's a cyclist in the network and we all represent cyclists that are injured. Uh, we work on advocacy issues. We work on cycling rights issues and we're all friends and we, we interconnect and we share each other's uh, information and we support one another. And the main idea is, is um, you know, to support the community through, through our, our work as attorneys, but also as cyclists. And it's a fun thing. So um, bikelaw.com, we have some decent uh, information and in columns and articles, and we have net lawyers in lots of different states. So it's, it's good to look up and see what's going on in your area and get involved. It's one thing that a lot of racers issue, you know, myself included. It's like, I, I don't have time for that kind of thing, but you know, we have to, we have to, chip into yeah the, the, the fast people yeah definitely definitely and it's, it, the work that you do in that area is, is definitely a, people appreciate it i was uh, are you still doing um the bella news column called uh legally speaking is that still going on i am i have one to do right now actually okay okay i'll so probably wait until after the tour people don't want to read about that right now but right uh, yeah, we're going to talk about um, group ride liability. It seems clubs, you know, they put on rides all around the country and, and the officers of the club, and they're wondering, you know, am, do I have legal liability by running these rides? And so we're going to discuss all the things to think about. Okay. Okay. Great topic. Look forward to seeing that. So uh, Bob Mianski, great to have you here today. And thanks for being on the podcast. Um, great conversation. Really fascinating. Um, thanks for being here and thanks everyone else for, for watching signing off. Cool. Thanks Mike. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching power in mind, the sports psychology podcast, where we talk to inspiring people in the world of sports and find out more about their mental game until next time. Be positive, inspire others and explore your mind.